Most of us see children as cute and adorable, the hopeful future of a new generation. Others see them as a burden of responsibility and an impediment to personal freedom. Regardless of your perspective, all over the world it is all too common for kids to suffer at the hands of abusive parents, bullies, pedophiles, and rapists. We might try to ignore this truth, might censor it, or simply avoid talking about it. But we cannot hope to cure this cancer that festers in our civilization unless we face it. Though our first instinct is to think of the children as victims, it's even worse when they are in fact the criminals themselves, responsible for gruesome acts of violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Number 10, Joshua Phillips. In early November of 1998, 14-year-old Joshua Phillips played baseball with his 8-year-old neighbor, Maddie Clifton, outside of Joshua's home in Jacksonville, Florida. Shortly thereafter, Maddie's family reported her missing and police opened an investigation into her disappearance. Police suspected that Clifton's neighbor, Larry Grisham, who had been previously charged with sexual battery on two prior occasions and also failed a polygraph test when questioned, However, Grisham provided an alibi, and the police dropped the case after their investigation didn't really come up with any good evidence. Community volunteers persisted in the search for Maddie, which included Joshua Phillips. The Clifton family handed out flyers at local events and offered $100,000 as a reward, drawing the attention of America's Most Wanted, who planned to broadcast the story. About a week after the reported disappearance, Melissa Phillips was cleaning Joshua's room when she discovered a leak in her son's waterbed. She peeled away the electrical tape concealing the tear and discovered Maddie's body. Maddie's body was found nude from the waist down, but the autopsy showed no signs of a sexual assault. Police recovered a baseball bat used to bludgeon Maddie and a knife that matched the 11 stab wounds on her face, neck, and chest. Joshua was tried as an adult and convicted of first-degree murder in a Polk County court. However, Joshua's age made him ineligible for the state death penalty, and instead sentenced him to life without parole. Fourteen years after the murder, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 2012 that sentencing convicted children to life imprisonment is unconstitutional, and in 2016, the court granted a retroactive appeal to re-sentence Joshua. His next court hearing is scheduled for February 2017. Number 9. Daniel Petri In 2007, 16-year-old Daniel Petri lived in Santa Catarina, Brazil. He had just loaned his friend 12-year-old Gabriel Kuhn 20,000 units of in-game currency in their favorite MMORPG, Tibia. Time passed and both carried on amiably, with Gabriel promising to repay the money soon. The Kuhn family chastised Gabriel for making friends with a boy they saw troubled and prone to angry outbursts, but didn't press the issue. Daniel was in fact a psychiatric patient who often missed his therapy sessions or left early and without permission. When Daniel came to collect on his prior loan, Gabriel either didn't have or refused to pay back the in-game currency. In a fit of rage, Daniel broke into the Kuhn residence while Gabriel was home alone and sexually assaulted the younger boy. Reports vary as to the chain of events that ultimately escalated the conflict to violence, but one witness saw Daniel leave the Kuhn residence with blood all over him. When Gabriel's mother returned from work, she found her son lying in a pool of blood and no longer in one piece. The police report stated that Gabriel had been physically and sexually assaulted, with severe bruising around his neck from an attempted strangulation with a wire cable but ultimately the cause of death was blood loss from dismembered limbs. The crime scene indicated that Daniel attempted to hide Gabriel's body in the attic, but he lacked the physical strength to carry the body up the ladder, even after the dismemberment. A Brazilian court tried Daniel as a minor. He received a three-year prison sentence and got released in 2010. Number 8. Kipland Philip Kinkle May 20th, 1998 at approximately 8am, 15-year-old Kiplin Philip Kinkle had just been suspended for receiving a stolen weapon and bringing it with him to Thurston High School in Springfield, Oregon. Kiplin was arrested and brought to the local police station where police charged him with two counts of possession. A year earlier, Kiplin suffered about a depression that left his parents, Bill and Faith, very concerned about his state of mind. They took Kiplin to psychologist Dr. Jeffrey Hicks, who prescribed Prozac and documented the steady progression of Kiplin's treatment in the months that followed. Despite Kiplin's improvement, he struggled to maintain healthy relationships with his parents and school friends. He developed a growing obsession with firearms and explosives. Kiplin purchased the Anarchist Cookbook online and several guns from local friends. 
some of which he purchased with permission from his parents. However, Bill was furious when he found out about Kiplin's arrest. He made several phone calls to friends and co-workers where he said, I don't know what to do at this point. At noon that same day, Bill picked up Kiplin from the police station and drove him home. After arguing about the incident, Kiplin shot Bill in the back of the head with a 22 caliber Ruger rifle, then dragged the body into the bathroom and covered it with a sheet. Over the next few hours, several people called the Kinkle residence looking for Bill. Kiplin lied about his father's whereabouts. When Faith arrived home from work that evening, Kiplin shot her six times in the face and chest, and also covered her with a bedsheet. The next morning, Kiplin loaded up his backpack with his ammunition and taped the 22 rifle to his leg, concealing it and two pistols under a heavy trench coat. He then drove his mother's Ford Explorer to school, where he opened fire on a crowded cafeteria, killing students Michael and Nicolaussen, Ben Walker, and wounding 25 others. Five students tackled Kipland as he reloaded and pinned him to the ground until police arrived on the scene. That same day, Lane County sheriffs raided the Kinkle residence and found two live bombs, one in Kipland's room and the other attached to his mother's corpse. Kiplin briefly pursued an insanity defense, but ultimately pled guilty to a laundry list of aggravated murder charges. He's currently serving 111 years in prison without the possibility of parole. Number 7. Lionel Tate July 28, 1999 Kathleen Grosset Tate was entrusted as a nanny to care for six-year-old Tiffany Unick for the evening. Kathleen left Tiffany with her 12-year-old son, Lionel Tate who were both watching television, and went upstairs to take a short nap. Approximately 45 minutes later, Lionel woke Kathleen to the chilling statement, Tiffany's not breathing. Kathleen raced downstairs to find Tiffany's ravaged body, who had 35 separate injuries including broken bones, ruptured organs, and a cracked skull. Lionel told police that he was only imitating pro wrestling moves that he'd seen on TV, and didn't realize that he had mortally wounded the girl until she stopped moving. Child abuse experts thoroughly refuted Lionel's story, testifying in court that the injuries Tiffany sustained were the equivalent of a fall from a third-story building. In 2001, Lionel's mother turned down a plea deal to reduce the charges to second-degree murder, which would have sent Lionel to a juvenile detention center for one year and 10 years of probation. Instead, the case went to trial, and Lionel was convicted of first-degree murder, where Judge Joel Lazarus sentenced Lionel to life without parole, making the boy the youngest convict to receive a life sentence. In January of 2004, an appeals court overturned Lazarus's decision and allowed Lionel to take the aforementioned plea deal. A few months later, Lionel was found by probation officers out of his house and carrying a 4-inch knife. They elevated his house arrest status to zero tolerance probation. One year later, Lionel robbed a pizza delivery guy with a firearm and stole four pizzas worth $33.60. Police arrested Lionel for gun possession and was sentenced to 30 years in prison for violating his probation and 10 years for the robbery, though both terms are served concurrently. As of 2017, Lionel has 19 years left on his prison sentence. Number 6. Andrew Golden and Mitchell Johnson March 23, 1998 11-year-old Andrew Golden and 13-year-old Mitchell Johnson had just had a conversation about their grades with one of their school teachers, Debbie Spencer, at Westside Middle School in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Mitchell politely responded to every question with yes ma'am, no ma'am. Though his friend Andrew is a bit distant and doesn't seem phased by his B- score. Later, Debbie would tell reporters that she knew the boys were up to something, though she had no idea what. The following day, Mitchell stole his parents' car while Andrew broke into his grandparents' house and looted an unlocked weapons cache. The boys then drove to school and split up. Andrew attended school like usual, while Mitchell broke off into a nearby construction site that bordered a bushy forested area. Mitchell found suitable cover and proceeded to load and place the firearms within easy reach. At lunchtime, Andrew pulled a fire alarm and ran outside to meet up with Mitchell. As students and teachers filed out of the designated exits, the young boys opened fire with rifles and pistols, including a Remington 30 6 rifle and a universal M1 carbine replica. Four students were killed, Brittany Varner, Stephanie Johnson, Paige Ann Herring, Natalie Brooks, and one teacher, Shannon Wright, who happened to be pregnant. Ten other people were also gravely wounded. Despite the careful planning and brutal execution of this school shooting, both boys were tried as juveniles and sentenced to confinement until the age of 21, the maximum allowable under Arkansas law. The boys had their public records sealed, though police still have their fingerprints on file. 
and were set free in May of 2007. Both attempted to acquire firearms upon release using aliases, and Mitchell succeeded in acquiring an illegal firearm. However, police arrested Mitchell for drug possession, petty theft, and confiscated his firearms. Number 5. Alex and Derek King in late November of 2001, 12-year-old Alex King, together with his 13-year-old brother Derek, have just ran away from their home in Cantonment, Florida. They shared a marijuana cigarette and played games at the house of a family friend, 41-year-old Rick Chavis, a previously convicted pedophile. For the boys, life is anything but simple. Their mother, Kelly Marino, struggled with drug abuse that ultimately led to her separation from their father, Terry King and the boys frequently moved in and out of foster care. Rick took an inappropriate interest in the boys and lied to their father as to their whereabouts. The boys also testified that Rick told them that he killed a man once and got away with it. Though the statement is untrue, it seeded in the young boys' minds the idea that they could finally be rid of the man who they saw as the source of their problems. On November 26, Alex and Derek King returned to their father Terry's home while he was sleeping. Alex egged on his older brother while Derek bludgeoned Terry to death with an aluminum baseball bat. The boys then set the house ablaze in an effort to cover their crime. What happened next is ultimately a mystery. Over the next few years, the King brothers changed their testimony and committed perjury in a slew of trials. In one case, Alex said that it was his idea to murder their father. In another, Alex said that both he and his brother were locked in the trunk of Rick's car at the time of the murder. The boys stated that they fabricated their confessions to cover up for Rick, knowing that they would receive a lesser punishment. In Rick's own trial, he stated that he only learned of the murder after the boys came to him and sought refuge from the police. Rick counseled them to tell the police that they killed their father in self-defense, and Alex testified in defense of Rick and admitted to having consensual sex with the older man. In the end, the jury found Rick Chavis not guilty of the first-degree murder and arson charges, but guilty of being an accessory to murder and tampering with evidence. The jury also acquitted Rick of the molestation charges, but found him guilty for falsely imprisoning a minor. Rick received a five-year prison sentence for the purported abduction and 35 years as an accessory to murder. For the boys, Alex confessed to hatching the plot and received a seven-year prison sentence, while Derek confessed to the actual murder and received eight years. Upon their release in 2008 and 2009, both boys took an oath of non-violence and stated that while they do not often miss their father, they deeply regret what they did and that they will pay for it for the rest of their lives. Number 4. Christian Fernandez March 14, 2011 12-year-old Christian Fernandez watches his mother, Bianella Susana, leave the house to take his elder half-brother to school. Bianella is only 12 years older than her eldest son, who was the product of a sexual assault by Christian's 25-year-old father. Christian is now alone with his other half-brother, 2-year-old David Galarraga. A practice Bianella later confessed to police was commonplace. Anger bubbles beneath Christian's icy stare as he watches his mother disappear from sight. He turns to face David, who plays with toys next to an old bookshelf. Christian shoves his half-brother's head against the bookshelf several times, killing the boy. When police discovered the crime, Christian confessed in the interrogation room and said that he was thinking about his stepfather when he committed the crime, and that it had nothing to do with his younger brother. Less than a year earlier, Christian's stepfather, Luis Galarraga Bianco, shot himself in the head in front of his children before police could arrest him on child abuse and molestation charges. At the time, Christian was taken to the local emergency room to treat a massively swollen black eye, retinal damage, and a doctor's examination revealed extensive long-term sexual abuse. When the case went to trial, Christian was tried as an adult, charged with first-degree murder, and faced a life imprisonment without parole. However, Christian found sympathy with Judge Mallory Cooper, who threw out the interrogation tape because he deemed Christian incapable of understanding his Miranda rights and what it meant when he confessed without a lawyer or adult present. The prosecution then offered a plea deal for a reduced charge of manslaughter, which Christian accepted. Christian received a seven-year juvenile detention sentence and will be released in 2018. Number 3. Jordan Brown In early 2009, 11-year-old Jordan Brown lives with his family in a peaceful farmhouse in New Beaver, Pennsylvania. It's early in the morning and Jordan's father, Chris, makes breakfast for his son and two stepsisters, while Kenzie Houck, Chris's pregnant fiancé, sleeps in late. It's just a normal, boring day in the average life of an American family. After breakfast, Chris wishes his son a good day at school and reminds Jordan to finish moving his things out of his room. The expectant family plan to repurpose Jordan's old room for the newborn, 
and Jordan had been dragging his feet about it for the past few weeks. Running a little late, Chris hustles off to work before the children's school bus arrives. A short while later, there's a muffled pop from inside the farmhouse. The tree trimmers outside the house didn't notice anything, and when the school bus arrived, Jordan and his eldest stepsister board the school bus just as they do every single day. The bus peels away quietly, and approximately 45 minutes later, Kenzie's four-year-old daughter, Adeline, ran out of the house screaming, my mommy is dead. The nearby workmen ran in to help and notified the police. First responders discovered the body of Kenzie Houck in her bedroom, killed by a single gunshot wound to the face. Her unborn child died of asphyxiation. Police discovered a discarded shell casing in the Browns' front yard that came from a 20-gauge youth shotgun found in Jordan's room. It was an Easter gift from his father. Police believe the shooter fired through a blanket to muffle the sound, explaining why the nearby witnesses heard no gunshot. Jordan was arrested soon after and remained in juvenile detention until the completion of his trial. Jordan was tried as a juvenile and both he and his father Chris professed Jordan's innocence throughout the trial. Kenzie Houck's family remained unconvinced and encouraged the prosecution to press for the maximum punishment. Judge John Hodge presided over the case and ultimately found the prosecution's evidence to be circumstantial but compelling, and found Jordan to be delinquent. And if you don't know what that means, it's basically the equivalent of a guilty verdict, but for children. Jordan received a seven-year juvenile detention sentence in April of 2012. Over the next few years, numerous appeals were filed by Chris Brown in multiple courts, and he pressed for a retrial on the grounds of circumstantial evidence, but was denied. Throughout his incarceration, Jordan completed high school, and with the help of his father, secured a modest college fund. Jordan completed five years of his sentence and was released early in 2016 for good behavior and signs of rehabilitation. Jordan changed his name, but still lives in the same Pennsylvania county. The Houck family told reporters that they were appalled by the court's decision at the trial and at Jordan's release. And while they feel justice has not been served, they've let go of the pain and are just trying to move forward. Number 2. Armajit Sada In May of 2007, local villagers in Musahri, India, confronted 8-year-old Armajit Sada regarding the disappearance of a 6-month-old girl named Kushbu Devi. Locals knew the Sada family suffered their own personal tragedy, when only a year earlier, they lost their 8-month-old daughter and 6-month-old cousin. Armajit happily recounted his tale to the concerned mother, casually describing how he bashed the infant's head in with a brick. He then led the villagers to the shallow grave, where the bereaved mother retrieved Kushbu's body and informed the police. When Bhagwampur authorities investigated the murder and questioned Armajit's parents, who provided little information to what they regarded as a family matter. Since then, Indian authorities have been very secretive about the incident, partially because Indian law wouldn't allow Armajit to be arrested or convicted of a crime. However, authorities put Armajit in detention at a children's home until the age of 18. Psychoanalyst Shamshad Hussain found Armajit to be suffering from a conduct disorder where a severe chemical imbalance in his brain makes him behave in a sadistic manner. Sufferers from this disorder take great personal satisfaction from inflicting pain in others. Armajit Sada is the youngest serial killer in the world and changed his name to Samarjit upon his release in 2016. According to doctors, his conduct disorder is manageable with medication and rehabilitation. Number 1. John Venables and Robert Thompson February 12, 1993 Ten-year-olds John Venables and Robert Thompson skipped school to hang out at the New Strand Shopping Center near Kirkby, England. They also stole batteries, a clockwork toy soldier, and even a bucket of paint. John and Robert walked past a TJ Hughes department store and attempted to coax a young child out of the store before the child's mother caught them and scared the boys away. It's then that they spot two-year-old James Bulger, who wanders out of the doorway at an AR Times butcher shop. James' mother, Denise, is momentarily distracted by the man at the cash register, who mixed up her order. The problem is corrected moments later, and Denise walks out to find that her son James is gone. Denise reported the disappearance to the police, who searched them all but couldn't find the boy. Two days later, James Bulger's sodomized and brutally beaten body was found on the railroad tracks outside Liverpool. Police observed 42 separate injuries and concluded that James was already dead before the train ran him over. Numerous stolen items from the shopping mall were found at the crime scene, and by reviewing security camera footage, the police identified John and Robert as the abductors. After John and Robert had been arrested by police, both confessed during their interviews. John was convicted as a conspirator, 
sentenced to confinement until he reached adulthood, and was released in 2002. Robert was convicted as a murderer and confined to the Barton Moss Secure Care Center in Manchester until his release in 2001. In 2011, John Venables was arrested again on charges of downloading and sharing child pornography, but was granted early parole with yet another new identity when released in 2013. Despite receiving significant special care, online witch hunts for both boys are commonplace, and one man, Scott Bradley, was mistakenly identified as Robert Thompson. Scott faced allegations of suspected criminal action by civilians for a wide variety of claims, which left him extremely depressed. Scott Bradley took his life and cited the abuse as his reason for his suicide. James Bulger's parents, Denise and Ralph, have also been stalked online by anonymous abusers who leave taunting or threatening messages on their social media. Denise told reporters that she dreads the thought that one of the online trolls might be the real killers, 